Hello and welcome to the Kamla Show. We bring you interviews and conversations with technologists, entrepreneurs, filmmakers, and other news from in and around the San Francisco Bay Area. Bill Pollard is a producer, writer, and director. Love and Mercy is his second film as a director. The film is about Brian Wilson, the driving force behind the group The Beach Boys. This was the group that gave birth to California sound and progressive rock music. They personified American music. At least to me, they personified American music growing up in India. Welcome to San Francisco. Thank you. It's great to be here. You took your own sweet time making your second film. Why? Um, I actually, I did, after I did my first film, I, I directed a lot of commercial and documentary work out of Minneapolis, but I didn't want to move to, to Los Angeles to get sucked into that whole thing. So did that for uh, 10 years, um, but was drawn ultimately back to the feature business, but decided to do it on a level of producer and wait for my opportunity to get back to directing, which thankfully happened for this film. Love and Mercy, tell us about the title. I know it's the track of a song that Wilson composed and released, but there's also a little story about Love and Mercy. Yeah, I mean, certainly everything that Brian went through um, in his life, which is a lot, and, and, and we try to deal with, you know, just a part of it here. Um, it really, uh, when then when you hear the song Love and Mercy, and the circumstances un- under which Love and Mercy was written and recorded, because um, it was actually written during that time uh, that he was still with Dr. Landy and, and kind of struggling with that whole thing, it... Um, you know, it just resonated so much, you know, both the lyrics and the music and the timing resonated so much with this particular telling of the story. And you've shown love and mercy in the film. You have shown the loving parts of Brian Wilson. You've also shown the desperate parts of uh, Brian Wilson. And you chose two actors to portray uh, Brian Wilson. Why? Well, I, I'm, I knew that I didn't want to do a biopic, uh, kind of standard you know, cradle to grave, as they say, um, telling of the story, because there's just too much to deal with, especially in Brian Wilson's life. He had so much going on that you could never get close enough and intimate enough with the character to really touch us in any human way. And that's what's interesting to me most of all is Brian Wilson, the person and the human side of it in a way that we can relate to it. Um, Yes, it's great the Beach Boys music is great and yes Brian's a musical genius but if you don't have the human element to me it's just like you know it's kind of like reading People magazine or something with all due respect it's just it's more about celebrity than it is about the human side of it so that's what I was most interested in since you're the producer and the director of the film how much of restraint did you have to exercise on what you wanted to leave behind and what you wanted to include in the film and I'm thinking of uh, Paul Giamatti as uh, the as the doctor you uh, while I was watching the film I, I, a thought went through my mind saying I wish there was more of Paul Giamatti in the film no, I, we get that a lot, to be honest, and, and because there's a lot of Beach Boy or Beatle, uh, Brian Wilson fans out there, and I, I know we're going to get that a lot. Why didn't you include this part, or why didn't you include that part, or why isn't there more of this person? Uh, you know, I mean, a classic example is actually um, Phil Spector, um, who played a huge role in Brian's musical inspiration and in his life. I mean, Phil Spector is one of the voices that Brian hears in his head to this day. So it was a huge influence on Brian. And we shot scenes with Phil Spector in them, um, Brian interacting. With, but at the end of the day, you're trying to create a movie that's going to have an impact on people and that it's going to flow in a natural way. And at some point, you just have to make sacrifices. And that was one of the, you know, there's a lot of those kind of in there. You just have to say, look, I know this is not the definitive portrait of Brian Wilson. It's not his life story. It's my portrait of Brian Wilson. And there might be others, and maybe they'll deal with these other things. But for me, this is the story that most resonated with me. When was the first time you heard the Beach Boys? Well, I grew up in that era. So, um, uh, you know, I remember seeing them on the Ed Sullivan show and all that. Um, But to be honest, I was more of a Beatles guy. I grew up more of a Beatles guy. My brother was a Beach Boys guy. I mean, I certainly appreciated their music, but I really, you know, I wasn't, you know, I just, I was just more into the Beatles. Um, You know, I think in college, Endless Summer came out, and I think I got more into them then. 
And then about 10 years ago, for some spontaneous unknown reason, I got into pet sounds really deeply, really appreciating it for, for the masterpiece that it is. Um, but I don't know why that happened, but it certainly set me up in a great way for when this project came along to be um, kind of close enough, yet not too close to be able to deal with it. I hear that you trained uh, to race in formula driving. So I'm wondering whether you, when you were studying in Seattle in the same school that your dad did, whether you ever drove down Highway 1 blasting Beach Boys on your car. Uh, well, that sounds like a great image. Unfortunately, no, <laughs> it didn't happen. Um, no, we, uh, you know, again, I really appreciated the music, but it wasn't until later that I really did get into it uh, enough. Um, <laughs> But that's a good illusion. I didn't have to do that. <laughs> Imagine if they had been called the Pendletons, which I believe was the original uh, uh, tra- uh, name of the group. Do you think they would have uh, succeeded? That's a good question. I think, honestly, I think they would have. Because, I, I, you know, it's amazing what happened with the band and with the whole surf culture, the whole California lifestyle thing and how Brian... Brian and his music have been so connected with that, and that certainly was a launching pad for his music. But the reason, I think, more than the California thing or the surf thing, is that Brian's music, there's something about it, there's a complexity to it, where it's still, but it's still accessible, that, that hooks into us more than your average music. And yes, those early tracks were about surfing and all that, but that's not what, I don't think that's what makes it so compelling. And, but it works in reverse, too. I think the music is so compelling that it leads us into those worlds. And now we look back on, you know, Fun, Fun, Fun or Surfing USA, and you, and you kind of remember, you relate it to your memories of the past and to summer and all that kind of thing. And it's really, it's an amazing thing, but I think it's something more complex than that. I'm not sure if we would all be sitting around being super nostalgic about about Pendleton shirts. Maybe we would be, <laughs> but who knows? So you mentioned you got hooked to Pet Sounds, uh, the album which you focus upon in this film. Uh, it was very interesting to watch how the tracks, the various tracks for this uh, album was created and the huge influence it had on the Beatles, and they themselves were influenced by the Beatles. And since you're a Beatles fan, what can you reveal about this Beatles-Beach Boys synergy that you left out on your editing table? Yeah, unfortunately, there was more of that in the in the movie. Again, you're always making these sacrifices. But it was clearly um, something that was very, uh, very powerful between the bands, or, or primarily between John and Paul and Brian that they were really going back and forth. This was not like a, like a, a myth that people have come up with. Paul and, and uh, Brian are still good friends today, and they still kind of exchange, um, you know, they, they still talk and all that. And back then they were exchanging things, you know, like uh, Paul would come over or John would come over and sit in the studio with Brian at times, and they actually have admitted where they've gone back and, and incorporated certain things in their music, and it, but it worked in reverse too, with Brian picking up things from from their work uh, that he reused. So it was a great dynamic, and you would have, if all things were perfect, it would have continued, and that Sergeant Pepper would have been answered with smile, uh, you know, kind of. But it, unfortunately, it didn't exactly happen that way. But it, but for the moment that it went on, for that period that went on, it was beautiful. So Smile was the album that never got released. Right, so that was, that's what Brian really was working on to respond to Sgt. Pepper. Like, they kept pushing each other. It wasn't like that's the only reason he was doing it, but it was part of the impetus for pushing himself even further. I mean, that was his nature anyway, it was to push, push the boundaries and keep exploring things. But I think having some healthy rivalry like that helps even more to give you that fire. It was very revealing to watch how much of sadness there was in his personal life, and yet the songs don't reflect that. But again, when you go back and listen to it, I think you do kind of sense that sadness in the words. Yeah. God only knows. You know, some of the songs, they sound very simple, but you can kind of hear the melancholy. I'm wondering how much of um, input did you get from Brian Wilson and his wife in the making of this film? Well, it was, I mean, it was perfect, to be honest. I mean, uh, 
first of all, you have a huge amount of material that's been written and films and all sorts of things that over the years, this huge source of material that we could draw on to kind of lay the story out. And then Brian and Melinda, of course, uh, like Melinda and Brian would tell us the more personal stories that haven't been out there. And then we had the benefit of going back to them and saying, you know, kind of showing how we're progressing with the development of it. And they could correct us if this wasn't, you know, going in the right way. But you also, you know, that so was the perfect combination. Sometimes when you're doing a movie about a real people, they can be too aggressive in wanting to, you know, mold the project or mold the story. And, you know, none of us could do a film about ourselves. We're not objective. So, but they were great about it and never kind of crossed that line. So it was the best of both worlds. How happy are you with your second film? Well, I think on, on one level, I'm always self-critical. So I, I can't sit through the movie without going, oh, I wish I had done this. Or is that speaker working right? Or, you know, so you're always... Uh, wondering about it and uh, I don't know I think it's somewhat maybe it's because I'm from the Midwest or something you always kind of have to look at the uh, you know what might happen or the uh, waiting for the other shoe to drop but um, no I'm very happy with the response it's gotten so far I mean, mostly because I can put it off on other people and say like the work that Paul Dano and John Cusack did all the actors the music people and, and the technical people just it's amazing that they can get this kind of satisfaction as well. You mentioned the Midwest. I didn't, so I'm going to follow up. You come from the land of the Andrew sisters, Bob Dylan, Prince, Prairie Home Companion, and Cohen Brothers. How was it growing up in Minnesota? Um, you know, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> I, you, when you grow up there, it's hard to contrast it with other things. You know, it's easier for other people to look at it from the outside and go this. But, you know, I, I, was, yeah, I guess I was kind of oblique bleakly referencing like the Prairie Home Companion, Garrison Keillor mindset of uh, that whole thing. But it's, it's true. It's true a lot of ways. But I mean, for me, it really helps to, and I work in Los Angeles much of the time, and the Hollywood kind of filmmaking world is a little insular, and it has its kind of uh, good sides and bad sides. But to be honest, to be able to live in Minneapolis and go back and forth, every time I land in Minneapolis, some of the ideas that sounded so great in Los Angeles suddenly don't sound so great, and you see them in a different light and able to get a different perspective on it. So I really appreciate that. Let me quickly switch to your role as a producer of films. And you, I think, have worked with participant media in collaborating with some of the films. Um, and I'm thinking of your uh, relationship with Ang Lee and uh, Terence Malik. How did you come to work with Ang Lee? Well, that, uh, yeah, just to clarify, we have worked on a couple things with participants. They weren't involved in Brokeback or, or, or Tree of Life. But um, uh, when we first kind of started doing this part of it and, and, and producing and, and helping to finance films, uh, we did it with Focus, did a deal with Focus. And we were kind of exchanging material projects back and forth to see which ones we'd want to do together. And there were a lot of things that went back and forth that we didn't like or I didn't like and they didn't like. Um, but one time, uh, David Lindy and James Seamus sent me a script called Brokeback Mountain. And obviously at that point, nothing was going on. Ang, Ang was just starting to, he, he was reading it, and I think he was ready to sign on, but he hadn't signed on yet. And yeah, it was just one of those things that I was really attracted to. For me, it's always about the material. I mean, as much as I appreciate and respect Ang or, or Terry or any of these people, uh, it, for me, it's really got to be about the material first. And then, yes, you want to work with a great director and, and things like that, but it's got to be the material. It wouldn't be simply driven by the filmmaker, no matter what. Yeah, I don't know, for some reason. So as a, as a producer, do you get uh, very uh, involved with these films that you're making, or do you take kind of a backseat approach? And I'm thinking of all the support you gave Terrence Malik in The Tree of Life. Yeah, that was a very close relationship, and that's why most, uh, that's the way I prefer it, to be honest. I mean, we've done films where I haven't been as involved or we're just getting support. But, you know, films like um, Into the Wild and, and The Tree of Life are things where I, you know, have a very strong connection with the filmmakers and also a big enough ego to be able to, you know, tell Terry that I think this is not working or something. I mean, 
you know, you do have to be able to do that sometime. And, you know, it can't just be one way. There's got to be the back and forth with producer and director. So thank you so much for your time. No, it's a pleasure. Thank you. You can listen to this and other interviews on our website, kamlashow.com, K-A-M-L-A-S-H-O-W.com. You can catch our TV interviews on our YouTube channel. I'm on Twitter. My handle is at Kamla. If you have any questions, suggestions or feedback, please feel free to send them to us. And as always, thank you for tuning in.